Okay, picking up where we left off last time, talking about hydrogen bonding. We said in order for hydrogen bonding to occur in a particular sample of a molecule, we needed a hydrogen atom connected to one of three small highly electronegative elements, so nitrogen, fluorine, or oxygen. So it's important, I think, to to step back a little bit and think about what are the possible structures that could have hydrogen bonding. So what we know about fluorine is fluorine resides in the seventh column of the periodic table. As a result, it tends to only form one bond. So there's really only one molecule where we have a hydrogen attached directly to a fluorine, and that would be HF, hydrogen fluoride, or hydrofluoric acid if it's in aqueous solution. So fluorine's not particularly interesting in terms of evaluating whether there's hydrogen bonding or not, because there's only one possible structure. Things get a lot more interesting, though, with oxygen, and even more so with nitrogen. We know oxygen tends to make two bonds when it forms a molecular structure. So we have a couple different possibilities. You could have an oxygen where both of the bonds are to hydrogen, right? That would be water. That compound is clearly going to have hydrogen bonding. But oxygen could also have one bond to hydrogen, another bond to something else. So say it's a carbon, now that carbon would need to have some other um, bonds because we know carbon tends to make four bonds in its structure. Let me make sure we get our lone pairs in here too. Um, this compound would also have hydrogen bonding because we do have the hydrogen directly attached to the oxygen. Now we could also have a case where oxygen, maybe it's connected to two carbons, each of which would then have three more bonds. So let's just make them all hydrogens. Right, that molecule's got oxygen and it's got hydrogen, but there would be no hydrogen bonding in that molecule. In fact, we'll see how this is going to relate into some questions we might want to be able to answer in the example problem right here below. Similar idea with nitrogen here, except nitrogen makes three bonds generally when it has a neutral charge in terms of formal charge. So we could have nitrogen compounds that have three hydrogens attached, or two hydrogens attached, or one hydrogen attached, or that don't have any hydrogens attached to the nitrogen. And all of those structures are gonna have consequences when we go to think about, is there hydrogen bonding? Isn't there hydrogen bonding? How can we relate the strengths of the intermolecular interactions? And that kind of leads us into the example here. And this is the kind of question we'll want to be able to address as you get toward the end of this chapter, you start thinking about you know, fun things like exams coming up. Um, if we take a chemical formula, C2H2O6, we're told it has two isomers. So isomer means same formula. So these would be two different molecules that happen to have the same formula. We're told one of these boils at 78 degrees C. So that's above room temperature. That would be a liquid at room temperature. The other boils at minus 24 degrees C, that would mean it's a gas. It's already boiled by the time the temperature had kind of risen up to room temperature. Well, with two carbons and an oxygen, there's really only two ways we can think about this molecular structure, right? Before we even think about putting in the hydrogens. One is oxygen's in the center of those three atoms and the other it's on the end. Now it could be on the left side or the right side in this first one, those wouldn't be any different. Um, but based on these two structures, if we fill in the six hydrogens based on what we know about formal charge, and that's that carbon's gonna tend to have four bonds, oxygen's gonna tend to have two bonds and two sets of non-bonding electrons. That will help us finish off these structures. So we need three more hydrogens there on that carbon. We need two more bonds on this carbon. So we'll put two hydrogens there. That would leave one hydrogen, and we do need one more bond on that oxygen to get it to zero formal charge. So one structure would look like that. Now, what we should notice right there, there's a hydrogen directly attached to the oxygen. So there's a place where we could consider hydrogen bonding happening between this molecule and the next molecule in a sample. Now over here in the other example, each carbon has one bond so far. So they each need three more bonds. That will account for where all the hydrogens go. 
and then there'd be two pairs of non-bonding electrons left over on the oxygen. Now, there's hydrogens in this molecule, and there's oxygen in this molecule, but the hydrogens aren't directly attached to the oxygen. So we don't have this situation where the hydrogen gets this fairly intense partial positive charge, or the oxygen gets this fairly intense partial negative charge. This molecule would still be polar, so we still have dipole-dipole interactions here, but we don't have hydrogen bonding because we don't have that particular architecture of atoms connected to each other. Now, what we said before is hydrogen bonding quite a bit stronger. It's still a dipole-dipole interaction, but it's quite a bit stronger than a normal dipole-dipole interaction. So what we would expect here is much stronger intermolecular interactions in this molecule, meaning it should take a higher temperature to make this molecule boil. Weaker intermolecular interactions in this molecule, meaning it doesn't take as much heat in order for the molecule to boil. So this one would be the one that has the higher boiling point. This one would be the one that has the lower boiling point. Right? This is exactly the kind of question we're going to want to be able to tackle toward the end of this chapter is, I'm going to give you a, a molecular formula, expect you to be able to draw some different structures, and then evaluate them in terms of what their uh, physical properties might be based on intermolecular interactions. Okay, now there's a couple more things we need to talk about to get through all these different types of intermolecular interactions. The fourth type of interaction here is something that happens in nonpolar when we start to um, incorporate nonpolar molecules into what we're thinking about. This is called a dipole induced dipole interaction. So we need to talk about what does this mean? What is an induced dipole? So a dipole, that's something that happens in polar molecules, and this is going to be relevant to right, the kind of example that I have below here. Water we know is polar. It has negative side and it has a positive side and it's a polar molecule. Now in the example what I want to talk about is fish live in water um, but they breathe oxygen just like mammals do um, who breathe it from the air. So there's oxygen there in the water, diatomic oxygen molecules. Now this goes against a little bit what we've talked about so far in terms of things like solubility. Oxygen, diatomic molecule, it's an oxygen on each side, it is nonpolar. Right? And the general rule for which compounds dissolve in other compounds is like dissolves like. And that tells us polar molecules don't dissolve in nonpolar molecules and vice versa. Right? This is why your Italian salad dressing separates out into the oil layer and the vinegar layer. The vinegar layer is water and acetic acid, both of which are polar. The oil layer is olive oil or some kind of vegetable oil. And those are big, long carbon hydrogen chains primarily, and they're not polar, so they don't mix together. So you gotta shake up the salad dressing before you use it, or you just get one or the other, and then your salad is not, not so good. Well. We, did, we know fish can breathe, though, so we know oxygen must dissolve in water somehow, and this induced dipole is how that happens. So we imagine a water molecule. Here's our water molecule. It's partly negative on that side. That means there's more electrons there than might otherwise be. If you imagine an oxygen molecule coming close to that water molecule, that negative charge, that's a permanent... Um, part of the water molecule is going to affect the electrons as they're distributed in the oxygen. So the electrons see that negative charge, and electrons don't like negative charge. So the electrons are going to move within the structure of the oxygen away from the negative charge. So they're going to move to the far end. That would mean a partial negative charge kind of on the top end of that oxygen molecule. And that would mean there's fewer electrons down on the bottom end, so there's a partial positive charge there. Well, now we have two different charges close together. That is the source of an interaction that can occur between oxygen and the water. So this is what's called an induced dipole. There's a 
a separation of electron density in the oxygen because of its interaction with the polar molecule. So this is what's going to happen when polar molecules and nonpolar molecules interact. In fact, you can see this in your salad dressing. If you look right at the, the layer between the vinegar and the oil, there's kind of a blurriness where those molecules are kind of interacting with each other in, in this sort of method. Now, this is something that only happens between two different molecules. So it's not as useful for things like predicting physical properties. The last type of intermolecular interaction, which does have a little more utility in terms of evaluating physical properties, is called a London dispersion force. Now, I think it's important that I tell you these are um, referred to by multiple names a lot of times. Sometimes you will see this as London forces. Sometimes you will see this as dispersion forces, if I could spell. And sometimes people will just kind of take a shortcut and call these LDF, London dispersive forces. Um, all three mean exactly the same thing. And once you understand where the um, forces come from, you should understand what's being referred to by any of those abbreviations. This is an interaction between an induced dipole and an induced dipole. Now, I think the best way to think about this is helium. So helium is an atom, so it, it can't really be polar because its electrons have to be evenly distributed because we don't even have a bond that could have different electronegativities. We think about helium. There's only two electrons. They live in the 1s orbital, or orbital subshell. And there's two electrons in there, and they're moving all about. So if you, if you imagine you had a camera that could take kind of an instantaneous picture of where those electrons are, and say we took a picture and the electrons were in those two positions, that would mean there's a little more electron density on this side than there is on this side. So we could think of this as a dipole, but it, it's an induced dipole. So it's induced by electron movement. And it's only there because the electrons are in motion and they aren't always perfectly evenly distributed. Well, if the electrons are moving in this helium atom and there happens to be another helium atom close by, the electrons in the first helium atom may affect the electrons in the second helium atom. This partial negative charge is going to drive away the electrons in the nearby helium atom, and maybe they move over to the other side of that atom. And now we have a negative and a positive. So there is our dispersive force. It is the interaction between those two partial positive and partial negative charges, right? Now that we have also induced a dipole in the second helium atom. Now, I said I was going from strongest to weakest. This is by far the weakest type of interaction. In fact, helium, the boiling point of helium is 4 Kelvin. So that would be minus 269 degrees Celsius. So liquid helium you have to go to almost absolute zero to get it to become a liquid and just a tiny amount of heat and it's going to boil you're going to break that interaction because it's not very strong right now we want to talk about how that strength can vary as we go into the next section of chapter 10.